I don't have opinions. I have demonstrable facts. <laughs> these facts are validated and these facts are repeatable. Fact number one, no one has ever shown that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming. Never been shown. And if it could be shown, then you would have to show that the 97% of emissions, which are natural, do not drive global warming. Game over. We are dealing with a fraud. It's a scientific fraud from day one. We hear the propaganda that increases of the gas of life, a trace gas in the atmosphere, will bring a disaster and that we will have runaway global warming. Sorry, folks, we've known for 200 years from chemistry that it's the exact inverse. Now, I'm sure some of you tried this last night at the dinner with a champagne or a beer and you forgot to drink it and it warmed up and it kept bubbling and bubbling and bubbling and bubbling. And that is the inverse solubility of carbon dioxide. We've known that for 200 years. We see it from the ice cores. When we drill into ice, we have chemical fingerprints that tell us what the temperature was, and we have little bits of trapped air. And we can show that when we had natural warming, some 650 to 6,000 years later, we had an increase in carbon dioxide. It's not carbon dioxide that drives temperature. It's the exact inverse. Another fraud. <laughs> We never hear about the major greenhouse gas, which is water vapour. And water vapour has a remarkable property, this weird water. When we evaporate water, we need energy to do that. Now, the Greens don't know this because they never get up a sweat. And when you get up a sweat, you feel that your skin is cool because you're taking energy to evaporate that water. And when you precipitate that water, as rain, snow or ice, it gives out energy, exactly the same amount that it took up. It is water vapour, and water, clouds, whatever form it's in, are the air conditioner of our planet's atmosphere. It isn't a trace gas, which is why the 115 models don't work. This is because they are trying to create a model that proves that carbon dioxide is doom and gloom. And we've had these sort of predictions for a long time. And in this absolutely wonderful tome, <laughs> I have a chapter devoted to predictions. And I've looked at 2,000 years of pre predictions, people predicting the end of the world. And we've had thousands of highly qualified, eminent people predicting the end of the world. If just one of these was correct, we wouldn't be here. So there's only one type of prediction you can make which is correct, and that is if someone's predicting the end of the world, knocks on your door, sool the dog onto them, because you've got history on your side. <laughs> and we hear about climate scientists whatever that is. Now, in geology, we have a 250-year track record of arguing about climate. Textbooks are full of it. We've been labouring about climate for a long while, and then there's this sudden new invention of climate science. And I had some of these when I was head of department at the University of Melbourne, and these are embittered, obscure, unemployable academics funded by your taxes, and those taxes are to fund these people's hobbies. And the end result of that is that they put good people out of work and they cost our nation trillions. So there's one group of people that use models. Another group of people, I mean, this is, this is really sinful. We use evidence. And the two are not in accord. And if they're not in accord, you've got to throw out the models, which we've seen time and time again are incorrect. So <clears throat> we can look back in the past and we can see that we've had six great ice ages. 
During that ice age, we'll have the ice expand, that's a glaciation, or it will contract, that's an interglacial. We are currently in an interglacial of an ice age that started on a Thursday 34 million years ago. <laughs> and the ice has come and gone. In our last interglacial, sea level was about seven metres higher. Temperature was about five degrees warmer. So if someone says, oh, this is the hottest day on record, you have to ask, since when? <laughs> if it's the hottest day in the last 120,000 years, then that is a record. But um, since when? So if we go to the peak of our interglacial, which was about 4,000 years ago, it was about five degrees warmer. So it's cooler than the hottest temperature on record. If we go to the time of Jesus, when it was warm, it's about four degrees cooler than then. If we go to the Dark Ages, go to the Viking Age, we've actually warmed up since then. If we go to the medieval warming, we've cooled down since then. And if we go to the Little Ice Age, we've warmed up since then. So since when? And I know this is going to surprise you, but we've just come out of a Little Ice Age. What do you think temperature's going to do? Fall or rise? <laughs> it's been rising since the Maunder min minimum more than 300 years ago. So it is no surprise that if you have cut off times for temperature or for sea level or for hurricanes or whatever, you can spin whatever yarn you want to spin. These six great ice ages started when we had more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. We have 0.04% of that gas in the atmosphere, which is meant to be a pollutant, which is colourless, odourless and tasteless. But this, this pollu pollutant is meant to kill you. <clears throat> now, gentlemen, please don't listen to this, but we can put this to a test a little bit later. And the test is really simple. I'm breathing out 4% of that dreadful pollutant. And if any of you ladies want a long Hollywood kiss with me, it's not going to kill you. And that's the experiment we've got to do. So line up, line up, and after you've bought one of these outside, we'll put this to an experiment. We have a problem with a crisis. It's not a crisis of climate. It's a crisis of common sense. It's a crisis of government policy. It's a crisis of education. And we hear words like emissions. Well, that means nothing to me because the atmosphere has changed in its carbon dioxide content from over 20% to now, which is really low in geological time. If we halved it, all plant life would die and animals would die. So we have a problem with language like climate crisis or extinction or emergency or transition. But what about net zero? We are blessed with a small population having a continent. We emit per capita quite a bit of carbon dioxide and this is because we are a mining and smelting nation. We are taking a hit for other nations by smelting aluminium, zinc, lead, zinc, uh, sorry, twice, uh, and uh, copper. And if we look at the total emissions of Australians, and then look at the total amount of carbon dioxide that we absorb through our grasslands, our rangelands, our crops, our forests, and our continental shelf, we only absorb 10 times as much carbon dioxide as we emit. So we have to revise that Paris Agreement and go to them and say, look, we want these incredibly wealthy countries that put out carbon dioxide, like Chad and Mauritania, to pay up, give us some money. We're doing our bit. So this whole business is ridiculous. This is gone berserk. We are now told what we can eat. And you can do the sums for beef by growing beef and sequestering carbon, we actually are at a net zero process already. No one is telling the Greens that what they can eat. We don't say to the Greens, you're not allowed to eat tofu. 
because no animals died in that process. But they're doing it to we healthy meat eaters. Now, I know from running geological field trips of students that you'd stop at an outcrop and, and the, the meat eaters would be the first to the top of the mountain. Halfway up would be the vegetarians, you know, <laughs> puffing out celery juice. And, <laughs> and the vegans would still be trying to work out how to get out of the vehicle. So <clears throat> I'm quite happy to be a meat eater. And we had one of our former prime ministers or prime minister tell us that this was the greatest moral crisis. It is a moral crisis. Certainly it's a moral crisis because the fundamentals of science are you do not tamper with the original evidence. That has happened with our temperature record where the past has been cooled and it makes it look, look as if we're warming. That is fraud and the whole process is based on fraud. We are terrorising young children. We are scaring them witless about the end of the world. And with a 30 second search on your mobile phone, you would know that the world's not going to end, that the hurricanes and sea levels, etc., nothing to worry about, nothing to see here. And this whole concept now has given us renewables. Now, these renewables need a complete rewiring of the grid. These renewables, wind and solar, if you want to build them, you expend more energy in building them than you do that they'll produce. If you want to build wind and solar, the amount of carbon dioxide to build them is more than they'll save. So why spend trillions? It's just not right. We also have that then flowing on to hydrogen. Not enough time for that. Electric vehicles or pumped hydro. But what we're doing is we're making ourselves very vulnerable in this country. Our solar and wind, solar panels and wind turbines come from China. Our wind turbines and solar panels have a very short life. If we kill off our coal and gas generation and have no nuclear, China completely controls the amount of energy we can produce in this country. That is really strategically stupid. And there's only one country in the world that's really survived by using solar. And it's Spain. I mean, the, the Spaniards are incredibly clever. And they have learnt to be able to generate solar power at night. You heard that correctly. So how do they do it? Well, it's very simple. The subsidies are so generous that you can afford to run a diesel gen set and floodlight the solar panels and still make a quid. <laughs> and that is telling us that this is a scam. The whole lot is a con and a scam. And you know, forget the birds and the bats and the scenery and farmland getting destroyed by solar and wind. We all know about that. But do we know that if we put up solar panels, they are built by slave labour in China. So if you're a supporter of solar, you obviously must be a supporter of slavery. If you are wandering around in your electric vehicle, prancing around, morally superior, then you need to be able to answer the question, well, why is it that you are driving an electric vehicle when that cobalt, most of which it comes from the, uh, the Congo, is mined by black slave children and the cobalt goes to China? justify that and that's where we conservatives have gone wrong. We've been on the back foot. We've never attacked and we have to attack the morality of the other side. Very easy to do because there's nothing there. <laughs> I won't go into what drives this. Zuby gave his 20 points. Absolutely magnificent. Um, and he didn't really <laughs> go into the mainstream media. There was once a time when it was a calling to be a journalist. We've got one or two of them here. I uh, had breakfast this morning with Piers Ackerman. He's one of those. Uh, our Sky team, they're there. But most, most journalists now are activists. They are stenographers for the Greens. And that's what you're up against. So what has this attack led to? It's got nothing to do with the environment. It's got nothing to do with climate. It's all about power by unelected people and all about money. And 
they are attacking your freedoms. They are attacking our environment. They are attacking your wallet. They're taking the money from the poor and giving it to the rich. So this is what we're up against. We're up against those who lie. We're up against those who are fraudulent and cook the books. So why do I write books like Green Murder? Well, that's exactly what it is. Green policy lead to people dying. Imagine this winter in England if you're a pensioner. You can afford perhaps to heat one room, perhaps to have a hot meal, and perhaps to have a warm shower, but you can't have all three. Now, this is a great country that's been destroyed by green policies. We are killing people with green policies. So I write books like this such that you can end up like me. I mean, what a, what a horrible thought, a perverse thought for you to end up like me. But you too can be cancelled. You too can be stopped from talking at universities. You too cannot be invited to dinner parties. You too can not have any mainstream bookseller sell this. You can, uh, greenmurder.com is a place to go for it, or outside at, the, at, at lunchtime. But we have to fight. And you have to fight with facts, and we have to fight much harder than we've ever thought, fought. It's, it's not the climate that's being threatened. It's the future of our children. And what we are facing is a 50-year dumbing down of our education system where our children cannot realise that they've been taught codswallop, they haven't been given the skills of argument, of critical analysis and thinking, and they are having their futures slaughtered. It is time to fight. It is not time to be like a normal conservative, polite and nod. You have to have your facts and you have to be able to fight fire with fire. And if you can't, then ask a really simple question. If someone says, oh, you know, this is the worst floods we've ever had, then all you've got to say is, well, that's interesting. Please show me the evidence. This is all based on evidence, not propaganda, and not feelings. Feelings can lead you astray, uh, especially hormonally driven feelings which give you huge problems in later in life. So <clears throat> it is time to fight and it's time not to let one word or sentence proceed in a discussion without you standing up and fighting. That's why I write books, to give you the tools for fighting because we're all in this together. Thank you.